All right. So my my clock just clicked over to 5:33. So I think I think we're going to start this off and I'm going to launch my screen. <laughs> Um, I'm going to launch my screen share here, if I can remember which one I was supposed to go with. I think it was that one. So you should all be seeing my uh, PowerPoint live and ready to go. So welcome um, to all of you who are here this evening. Um, again, uh, some of you again, or most of you again, welcome to anyone who might be new to this set of programs. My name is Amy Sopchak Joseph, and I'm an assistant professor of history at Wilkes University. Um, so I am broadcasting from Wilkes Bear, Pennsylvania, into your homes this afternoon. And I'm launching uh, today's session, and I'll be speaking, um, we'll be hearing a bit from Connie King, who is the curator of. Um, Women Get Things Done, the exhibit that I've been uh, collaborating with her on and that I'll be uh, helping to contextualize tonight a bit. Um, so I just wanna remind us of a couple of things about how to navigate our screens since we're in a Zoom webinar. Um, so you don't have to worry about accidentally ending up on camera or anything as I was just saying. Um, that's not an option, only uh, those of us who are hosts will end up on camera. But if you have questions, um, and if you look at the menu that often comes up along that bottom of your screen, you have a variety of options. Um, and one of them should be Q&A, and it should have two little bubbles there. So if you click on the Q&A, um, that's where we encourage you to submit any questions or comments that you have for us as we're moving through the materials. And you also have the option of raising your hand and we're going to try to keep our eye too on that participants tab. So if you raise your hand um, at some point or once we get to the, the Q&A section, um, you can always raise your hand, we will see that and we can allow you um, to unmute yourself. So if you're willing to, to go on mic, um, we can actually converse with you a little bit when that time comes. So just remember those are your options there um, for you. So tonight, um, in this third installment of Debating Woman's Place in America, 1860 to 1880, um, I've set this up pulling on this quote from Francis Willard this idea that aggregated, we become batteries of power. So this fits in as our last um, um, session. So I wanna remind us a little bit about where we've been and where we're going. Um, almost a month ago, uh, which seems like it was much longer, but it was only about a month that we first came together on September 16th to talk about separate spheres and suffrage. Uh, to talk a little bit about the dominant gender ideals about um, the, the women and men um, we're thinking about and trying to adhere to in the 19th century. And then two weeks ago, we talked a bit about shattering the sphere, um, women's labor and economic power. What I want to do tonight is to try to bring us full circle. And, and what Connie is going to do with us too is bring us full circle a bit. As a child of the 1980s, I grew up absorbing the general cultural message that women can do anything. I grew up playing with dolls and toy kitchen sets, but also devouring many, many books. Uh, my parents actively encouraged me to be a high, achieving, um, a high achiever academically so that I could get into a good college, even though neither of them had gone to college themselves. There seemed to be little question that whether I wanted to have a career or have a family or have both, that the option to operate in both the public sphere and the domestic sphere would be totally up to me as an adult. And I'm sure that I am not um, unique in having this experience. Women's ability to occupy public and private spheres and to earn wages are matters of both personal desire and socioeconomic status these days. For many working and middle-class families, 
the economic contribution of a working wife and mother is imperative um, to achieving a middle class standing. Prior to the COVID-19 epidemic, employment outside of the home was also a key piece um, to many women's self-fulfillment um, of fostering one's individual identity and to making contributions to a wider society while also um, contributing as raising as mothers to, to children and to sharing household duties with partners, whether those are male or female. For many other women, the ability to freely embrace the private sphere is in its own sense a feminist act of agency. The ability uh, to choose to focus on child rearing or um, in these days, elder care, or perhaps both. Um, it, it's a bit different to be able to choose those actively as opposed to fulfilling those roles um, as kind of um, imposed or encouraged by society, I would argue. There's no doubt that the pandemic is shaping and will continue to shape this debate. Um, more importantly, it's shaping women's realities on a day-to-day -day basis, forcing some to put aside their desires in light of overwhelming responsibilities that are on their plates. And I just saw, yet again, I think two weeks ago, I said I had just seen a news article about women leaving the workforce. And yet again, literally this morning, watching CBS News, I saw yet another report on a new, um, or a new story on, <laughs> on a new report that has just come out um, about how many women are leaving the workforce <laughs> Um, because of the pandemic. So as I've tried to lay out um, during this session or these set of sessions and what women get things done does um, materially in the gallery at the library company is doing much to try to show that Americans have long faced tensions related to women's roles in society. Given my own experience growing up to believe one thing uh, but to experience great challenges that actually exist in making this a reality, this fascinates me and drives my academic research, this kind of tension uh, between reality and ideal and the, the long history behind it. And we can see women's experiences in the Civil War marking a shift. Um, so that's part of what we're going to explore tonight with this material and with the exhibit itself. And I wanna focus here on collaboration among women because this was such a key part of this story, I think, and what a, a huge part, I think, about what Connie was also highlighting in the exhibit. And this collaboration is linked to a number of things. Sometimes it's linked to benevolent causes or reform movements. Sometimes it's linked to suffrage. Um, and many of these collaboration, collaborations were driven by women's desires to contribute to and to improve the world around them. But women were not united in their ideas about how to affect that change or even necessarily what quote unquote improvement um, of the world around them might mean. I wanna say a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, I had a cold last week, so I'm still coughing a little bit here and there. I want to um, take our discussion back to situate this 1860s and 1870s moment um, briefly, because uh, we're going to start to see some patterns emerging. And I, I wanna be able to highlight a bit and have us talk a bit about what's really new and what's maybe a little old in the 1860s and 70s. At the same time that we had that emergence of um, the idea of separate spheres that men should occupy the public sphere of business and politics and women should occupy that um, private domestic sphere, we have lingering questions. Could women be political? And should women be political? Those are two slightly different questions and both are being asked. Um, how should they um, not just act in partisan politics, but how should they wield power um, or influence um, decision-making. And we could see to some extent in this kind of antebellum period, a focus on women's individual influence in the private sphere. Thinking about um, separate spheres is really 
emphasizing, as an ideology, emphasizing that women can have influence. They can um, participate in these discussions, but those discussions should take place in that private sphere and that influence should be on those closest around her as opposed to occupying the public sphere and taking these decisions more broadly. But the reality, um, and we've seen a little bit of this and we'll continue to see it tonight. The reality was women were not only acting in the private sphere, to, to be sure. Um, some of them were in trying to influence um, their husbands and sons um, and perhaps their votes. But in reality, women were active in public um, as public actors and as political actors. We've heard a bit um, about their work as authors and lecturers earlier on. And we've heard too a little bit about their participation in, uh, in these collaborations um, as benevolent societies and reform societies. And these include a really wide range of things. I think um, much of this story is often linked to the growing anti-slavery and abolition movements, because of course that's where uh, people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott um, uh, end up um, having experiences that propel them, uh, for example, to call the meeting at Seneca Falls in 1848. It's undoubted that participation in those movements was incredibly important to this um, debate overall. But even um, before kind of the, the increase in anti-slavery and abolition uh, sentiments, we had moral reform societies um, and charitable societies emerging in places like Philadelphia and Boston in the post-revolutionary period where women were active in um, trying to fundraise or trying to um, extend help to people in need in their communities. And in the antebellum period, some of these will turn into kind of reform societies linked to the temperance movement, um, a, a movement focused on um, decreasing the use of alcohol or eliminating the use of alcohol, um, as well as moral reform movements. Um, for example, um, trying to reform women who were engaged in prostitution in urban areas and trying to find them um, uh, other types of employment and other ways to um, uh, support themselves. So we have women who are active in all kinds of public, very public things um, and wielding degrees of power um, in terms of both decision-making and perhaps using some money to um, influence what is going on around them. Petitioning Congress is an important piece that kind of emerges in this antebellum period and that continues to be really important in the 1860s and 1870s. Um, this debate really emerges in the late 1820s, early 1830s around the Indian Removal Act. Um, women, some, at least, at least some American women, believed very strongly that they should have a say in issues like Indian removal um, because women wield this moral influence. And so uh, particularly around Indian, Indian removal, women will um, exercise their First Amendment right to be able to petition their government. And the anti-slavery movement and abolition movements will pick up on this um, in the antebellum period as well. Um, to the, to the, they will be enthusiastic enough that uh, Congress will get to the point where they essentially immediately table all petitions coming in um, that are related to anti-slavery and abolition uh, by the late 1830s. And we have these women's rights conventions. Another way, all of, all of these are really ways that women are collaborating with each other and with um, men. But these women's rights conventions um, that emerge um, before, just before, and kind of um, also extend after the Civil War are another of these key pieces of collaboration. There were 11 national women's rights conventions um, that were held um, in northern states with the first one starting in 1848 and the last one being held in 1869. Um, and they take a break during the Civil War. There are none held actually during the war. These are also growing out this uh, sense of collaboration um, and the usefulness of working together. 
um, emerges out of women's experiences with female anti-slavery societies. And these conventions actually um, encourage and, sp and spur additional interest or wider interest in women's rights uh, because they're, they extend beyond the kind of temperance movement or the moral reform movements, which are uh, often religiously uh, affiliated. Uh, women's rights kind of moves beyond um, the, the religious affiliation to really bring more people into the fold. But all of these, or at least these uh, women's rights conventions are going to avoid entering into partisan political discussions. Uh, and this, uh, I think, we'll start to examine as we're looking at um, the, the actual collections materials. We're going to see a number of shifting perspectives in the 1860s and 1870s. Um, and one of the key things is a kind of shifting sense um, or a, potentially a, a kind of rolling back of some of the criticism that women endured in the antebellum period. Um, as women are, are striking out as authors or as lecturers in front of large audiences of men and women, as women are beco becoming more and more involved in reform societies, attending meetings, um, participating in, in fundraising efforts, as they're petitioning Congress and attending these women's rights conventions prior to the Civil War, they're also doing this in the face of a lot of criticism. Um, only a minority of people were um, widely supporting some of these um, activities. And with the 1860s and 1870s, particularly thinking of the Civil War as a kind of hinge between the, the kind of um, pre-war sense of um, uh, separate spheres and what I kind of think of as a post-war sense of, of separate spheres. It's not that separate spheres aren't uh, that those ideas aren't still circulating and that they don't hold weight, um, but they're, they're functioning a little differently um, after women's participation in the war. And we talked a little bit last week about how women participated in that war in numerous ways, um, uh, both economically um, in terms and uh, kind of materially providing uh, materials, helping to sew uniforms and put together materials like that. There also, we talked a bit about nursing as one of these kind of key pieces um, that comes out of the war. But another collaboration that's going to come out of the war um, was among kind of our two um, key people in the women's rights movement, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, um, who created the Women's Loyal League during the war. And I, I mentioned this just briefly because Connie is going to show us a piece about this um, in just a moment. And the Women's National Loyal League uh, sought to address politics more directly um, than mobilizing for war in terms of providing material support um, or participating as a nurse, um, etc. The Loyal League walked right into partisan politics and launched a huge petition campaign. And Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner brought their petitions to Congress um, multiple times as they um, collected signatures. So the Loyal League is going to approach this um, in some similar ways as we're seeing uh, from before the war, but also is going to start functioning in a kind of different environment than women had been functioning before. This petition drive that Stanton and Anthony um, helped to spearhead with their organization seemed to indicate to women's rights leaders that their work was of value and of influence. Um, this petition campaign was helping to support the passage of the 13th Amendment and they seemed to feel that this was um, of value and, and influential. So in 1864, Elizabeth Cady Stanton prophesied women will undoubtedly be a power in the coming presidential campaign. Women were already speaking on all phases of the question and hence uh, the importance that we know where we speak. And yet um, it is going to be another few decades um, before women get direct influence on those presidential campaigns um, in order 
to express their, their views at the ballot box. So we still have this functioning as a, a huge debate um, and with women trying to position themselves. And so it's at this point, thinking about where these old strategies and um, new, um, the, the new historical context come together, that I want to hand it over briefly to um, Connie, or not so briefly really, to Connie to talk a bit about um, another portion of the exhibit. So she um, talked to you about parts of the exhibit last week, and we saved a portion for this week. So I'm going to stop sharing my material for just a second so that I can hand it over to Connie. Thank you, Amy. Um, and before I start sharing my screen, I have, I want to just tell, say a little that will bridge the last session to this session. Um, because I think it's worth looking at how the women in the club movement had certain things that were in common with the kind of activism that we associate with Lucretia Mott and um, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and all the other, you know, very, very recognizable names in the panoply of important 19th century suffragists. Um, so at the last session in my walkthrough uh, for the first part of the exhibition, the final section we looked at was that section on the women's club movement and organized philanthropy, which is often and, and probably rightly considered uh, typically top down. The, reform, the people in the club movement and in organized philanthropy thought they knew what was best for the people they were helping. But frankly, it's not that simple. Uh, there were some very progressive aspects within the women's club movement. Uh, and there are also, as we can see later, some top-down aspects within the reform movement. So, uh, for example, I want to bring up something that uh, I don't have a screen uh, shot for, but I highlight in the show, the New England Women's Club suggested that every home having its own kitchen was a huge drain on women's time and energy. They proposed that instead there should be centrally located cooperative, cooperatively run kitchens that would serve many households. And that would free a lot of time for women who were ordinarily stuck with a lot of household labor. And it is no accident that these women, some of them were members of a particular um, utopian experiment that most of you, I'm sure all of you have heard of Brook Farm, which was going on in the 1840s. And famously, Brook Farm had the motto, labor without drudgery, and it sought to recalibrate the work-life balance so that people could be free to be self-actualized, to use a slightly anachronistic term. Historians have noted that the men from Brook Farm, to various degrees, participated in this grand experiment, but the women, not so much. Basically, they were doing the same level of household labor as ever, with little time to read and discuss the big ideas of transcendentalism. Uh, so I find it fascinating that some of the women who had been involved in Brook Farm, uh, my personal favorite is Abby Morton Diaz, who taught at Brook Farm and later was a significant member of the New England Women's Club, were also thinking about the benefits of collectivism in the 1870s. Um, so I, I, you know, I kind of want to see some of these long trajectories such as Amy was talking about just now. And I find this a very interesting aspect of the club movement generally. So tonight I want to do a very quick walkthrough of the final section of the exhibition, and let me see if I have the skill set here. There we go. So last time we were talking about cirrhosis, which was uh, not the Boston one, but the New York City Women's Club uh, that had been founded by Jane Crowley. 
its members, if you remember, uh, uh, consciously distanced themselves from the radical women who were advocating voting rights for women. Uh, and they eschewed engagement in traditional politics. But ultimately, cirrhosis was amazingly political. In August 1869, cirrhosis convened the first meeting of what they called the Women's Parliament. The Women's Parliament was designed to address issues that related directly to women's spheres, as defined in 19th century America, you know, the, the ideals that Amy was talking about. Uh, but the issues that they thought related to women's spheres were things like the importance of kindergartens and public education generally, how to help working women, how to organize daycare, and home economics generally. This car Harper's cartoon aside, uh, many, if not most, women's clubs did manage to escape criticism because they from the exterior conformed to a lot of the ideals of women, about women um, and the separate spheres. Um, and like I said, they, they distanced themselves from those other women, those other women who were so radical, uh, one of whom was Victoria Woodhull, who ran for president in 1872. But when you look at the fourth section, what more can women do, which examines how women sought to reorder society, you find that there isn't that easy or either or thing going on. There's a lot of top down stuff going on in some of, of these activist, you know, traditionally activist uh, movements, such as the abolition movement, the temperance movement and the women's rights movement. When Susan B. Anthony, uh, and, and now I'm jumping back, I want to talk about Susan B. Anthony because I think she's very important and we sort of downplayed her last time. But in the antebellum period, in the 1850s, there was a huge backlash against uh, women wanting to usurp men's proper place in society. And the thing that was the powder keg was Susan B. Anthony wanting to, uh, uh, excuse me, um, Susan B. Anthony wanting to speak uh, at a temperance movement. And that was the beginning of the Women's New York State Temperance Society way back in the 1850s. And the whole backlash against um, bloomers came out of that single moment and popular culture couldn't get enough opportunities to ridicule the so-called radical women who wanted their husbands, and this little doggerel under the cartoon says it, uh, they're asking their husbands, so runs their speeches, to put on frocks while you wear their breeches, the women, where the women wear, wear the men's pants. Uh, consequently, as a result of this huge backlash that uh, showed up, you know, to our modern perspective and over a fairly innocuous circumstance where women wanted to speak at a public m meeting about temperance, um, it really sets the tone for a lot of women very carefully trying to prove in their lives that they were not affiliated with Susan B. Anthony or you know, the, the, the so-called radicals. Um, and as, as Amy pointed out, during the war, there was the Women's Loyal League and they were extremely uh, active in working for uh, the abolition of slavery. Um, they submitted 100,000 signatures in their first installment. And let me, let me have a, a moment bragging about this piece. When the people installing the exhibition um, asked where to hang it, I said it has to be really prominent because it's sort of, um, it isn't obviously, um, it's sort of an unassuming piece, but it's tremendously important that we have it. 
I don't think there are many of these uh, blank forms survive, but you know, this is the form that was circulated and eventually 400,000 names were submitted to Congress and rightly the Women's Loyal League is uh, credited with being one of the fairly important groups that helped convince Congress to pass the 13th Amendment in January 1865. And after the war in 1866, the American Equal Rights Association, another group, brought activist men and women together for the next big project, universal suffrage, to end the disenfranchisement of black men and also women, both black and white. And some of the most prominent members of the abolitionist and the women's rights movement were among its members. But the problem was there was a lot of infighting. The unity of purpose didn't last. In 1869, the women's rights movement split into two factions. One faction argued that suffrage for black men was too important to risk a delay over the issue of woman suffrage which was a very extreme position for a lot of people. But the other faction said that the 15th men Amendment had to pass only if it gave men and women the right to vote. And that second group was Stanton and Anthony's National Woman Suffrage Association. And of course, the 15th Amendment passed giving black men the vote in 1870 as free men, which introduced the idea of male maleness into the Constitution. And it still left women disenfranchised. And um, uh, this is another one of these unassuming documents that I think we're very proud to have at the library company. But like so many things in the show, there's, there's a lot of reading. And if you go online, you can zoom in and see what's in this text. It's really quite uh, remarkable, um, but also quite clear um, because th this group lost a lot of their the support and the reason for the, um, the problem between the two groups that created the split was that some of the NWSA members said that women, and we assume white women, uh, was what they were thinking, uh, deserved the vote before men of various ethnic minorities. And that was what really kept this split going for 20 years. It was um, a lot of bias uh, that showed that some of these white women were extremely sure of their own entitlement um, who were in some of these leadership roles. And unfortunately, they're, they're some of our, our major icons. Um, so like I said, this split in the women's movement wouldn't end until 1890. And as you know, the, the, the successful push for voting rights for women wouldn't be until the 20th century, culminating, of course, in 1920. In the meantime, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, under the leadership of Frances Willard, grew to become the largest women's organization in 19th century America. Frances Willard used temperance as a wedge issue for a wide range of reform activities. Under her leadership, large numbers of conservative women moved into pro-suffrage activism without the stigma of radicalism. So while the other groups were, were mired in infighting, Willard expanded the tent and clearly showed that this was this this position for the WCTU was in keeping with the ideal of, of womanhood that was so important in the, in the mind of 19th century Americans. 
She successfully characterized women's activism as an extension of women's traditional roles as protectors of the home. Uh, the WCTU memorialized Willard in this postcard, and that's where the quote comes that you saw on Amy's slide that showed up first. Alone we can do little, separated we are units of weakness, but aggregated we become batteries of power. It's important to note that even in 1920, um, when you have universal suffrage, there were, there were cracks because state and local legislation often was created to create barriers. And there is still impediments to voting for some populations today. I think, I think we have to, to, in the middle of celebrating 1920, we should remember that there are still some things that have uh, ongoing um, um, dimensions in, the poli in political life. And of course, it's worth noting that the Equal Rights Amendment, first crafted by prominent 20th century suffragist Alice Paul, has never been ratified. And that's sort of where I want to end, because I think I want to talk about how important some of these issues are and how interconnected they are, and also how uh, there's, no, there's no finality to 1920. Uh, so let me just remind everyone uh, that the show is now online and you can get it at https librarycompany.org slash WGTT. Amy, are you there? I am. I am still here. Um, and what I think is so interesting about this period that we're actually living through is that now there's so many options to access materials or the organizations are thinking um, creatively and strategically about making resources available. And I think it's so interesting and you know it gives people a kind of different experience that it would be great if we could go in to the gallery and be able to see these things and see them laid out but as connie said um, this also gives us an opportunity actually to move in and look at things um, closely or in a different way um, than one might necessarily do um, if you were there, you know, for half an hour, or 20 minutes, kind of scanning through, now you can look at that petition uh, page and read through it or, or look at um, some of these, as Connie called them, unassuming documents, uh, which I love as a, as a kind of thought about these. So I want to um, open up a little bit and remember that if you have any questions, um, you can pop those into the Q&A um, down at the bottom, if you um, click on that, it should open up a box for you and allow you to submit questions. Um, but I have a, a question for Connie, because this looking, getting to look through the exhibit itself, whether you're online or whether you get a chance to go into the gallery and see it, the finished exhibit gives us, and rightly gives us, the impression that this is a really rich topic that the 1860s and 1870s produced a number of debates that, that pull on earlier um, material and that we uh, can see some familiar pieces in today as we uh, live as women in the United States. And so this is a, a rich topic with many sources at library company um, to explore it. Were, were there challenges that you experienced as you um, sought to craft this story to, to tell people. Um, was this, I think the finished product gives us the sense that this is, you know, it comes together, we have a story to tell. But along the way, were there challenges in trying to put this together? Well, I know the chronology was hard because I wanted to start at the Civil War and show how for certain women, the war was a transformative experience and how they may not have been some of the leading names, but there were so many women who were doing such 
significant things who were household names in the 19th century and people have studied them separately with biographies or as in groups in terms of the club movement or the women who were involved in uh, the sanitary commission work during the Civil War. But I wanted to sort of stitch together a lot of things and, and in a sense show what were, things were happening concurrently. And then right. when I got to talk about the last section on suffrage, I knew I didn't want to go back to 1848 because that story is so familiar, but I couldn't talk about women and political life without talking about how this image of the bloomer from the 1850s just sent shockwaves through uh, American womanhood, that you didn't mm -hmm. want to be one of those women. And it kind of sets the stage for why, um, what am I trying to say? Why Frances Willard and the WCTU, whose movement is often associated with failure because of how the Prohibition Amendment was such a dismal uh, outcome for a lot of her big plans for what right. parents would do to solve every possible social problem. Um, I wanted to show the extent to which Frances Willard affirming normalcy and womanliness to some of these fairly activist ideas uh, that really brought so many people into her tent who wouldn't otherwise have been, how, what an effective strategy that was, that was for her. So I guess the two things I found as challenges were how to tell the story of the 1860 to 1880 I wanted to tell without telling the whole before times. Right. <laughs> I didn't tell 1880 to 1920 without doing things the library company couldn't do because we don't really go into the 20th century the way we go through 1880 where our real strength is and how, well, the 1890s opens up a whole new chapter and I didn't particularly want to do that because I'm doing that in March with women and bicycling and, and it's a, it's sort of the uh, renewed fashion for bloomers in the 1890s. So stay tuned for March for the next installment. So, so good. So there's, there is more down the road uh, coming that, that's related to this. I mean, I think that's a great point. And this is part of why, I mean, part of what I want to point out about this really is that this, this is a story, but this, there were multiple kind of editorial decisions that have to be made about telling this story, right? In terms of both thinking about um, what is in the collection, uh, what you can feature, but also trying to figure out how can you coherently tell a story um, about this particular time period um, that people will understand without making it sound totally bizarre. And I, and I understand that for some people, I don't know what kind of journey all of you who've part been participating in the last couple of weeks have gone through, but perhaps it was a little surprising to spend um, so much time or a good amount of time thinking about kind of antebellum ideas about gender roles for men and women. But to some extent that 1860s and 1870s period while it is its own period and have its, has its own things, you know, important um, organizations that are being founded and that are, are functioning. And also is consumed by this um, conversation about whether to extend suffrage to women, particularly white, really meaning white women, uh, versus extending suffrage to African-American men. A huge uh, political debate but also can't really completely understand why that debate is going on without that earlier piece, 
or can't understand some of those cartoons, political cartoons, if you don't understand um, what a sensation bloomers and what kind of criticism bloomers um, uh, experienced earlier on. So to some extent, I mean, I think that it's, it's difficult to tell this story without kind of seeing that earlier part because there's so much about it that is so specific. And yet there's so much about this story that has been told this year um, in, in other places, right? About with this anniversary, um, thinking about the kind of 1900 to 1920 piece or maybe 1910 or uh, World War I to 1920 piece. It seems like so many other places are also telling that story. Um, so I think it's, it's been really um, great and interesting to get to see here a time period that we're not really seeing um, discussed or seeing discussed differently um, as a kind of precursor to, to suffrage when really it's, uh, they don't know suffrage is going to come down the road. Um, so we have to, right, it's like, so we have to kind of understand this material um, on its own merits to some extent. And I, I'm stuck on this idea that you've talked about a little bit about these unassuming documents, which we get to see digitally in the, the um, exhibit, but that are also um, physically being displayed, right, as part of the exhibit itself. So can you say a little bit about what kinds of choices go into making, um, making an exhibit? Um, are there pieces in the collection uh, there at Library Company that fit in this story, but just didn't kind of make the cut or didn't end up on the cutting room floor, or they, or they ended up on the cutting room floor, so to speak, um, because they just don't um, uh, lend themselves maybe to an exhibit overall? I had... A couple, and and I I think I mentioned um, that I'm extremely fond of Abby Morton Diaz and uh, the fact that she taught at Brook Farm and later was in the New England uh, Women's Club. Um, I had to drop something for want of space, and also because it was not visually compelling. It was all text, whether where I wanted to uh, show. Uh, some significant text, uh, but she also writes short stories, and the short story I wanted to include had this really troublesome title that I couldn't put in a case without discussing what it meant and what it would mean to a 19th century person. The short story is about how, again, how women are stuck in the kitchen and men don't understand how much household labor they're putting on them with their demands. It's called Slaves of the Rolling Pin. And the idea, and it's a cute story, that men are so demanding and they want pies all the time and they don't want fruit and bread and butter, they want pies. And how you're stuck, you're never able to read because you have to make pies. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a cute story. But the idea that she calls women slaves of the rolling pin troubled me a great deal because it, it sort of suggested that the metaphor of chattel slavery was okay to use for white women's household labor. And it just, uh, it, it bothered me. It just didn't seem like the right thing to put in the case without taking on that subject really, really in its own as its own big topic. Um, and I would want to do that some other time, you know, a different way. Mm -hmm. But to just put it in, in the women, in the New England Women's Club <laughs> section of the exhibition right. seemed wrong. And of course, the other thing is I wanted to touch the New York Women's Club and the, what was happening in New England and what was happening in Philadelphia. So everything just sort of shrank. Every time I had a bunch of things, I had to pare down and see what had to be tossed back. And when I got to the last section, I really wanted to do something with Carrie Burnham because Carrie Burnham sued in Pennsylvania saying that the 14th, which is a very important amendment, 
I know Walter Greeson, I mean, this is an aside, Walter Greeson is a contemporary historian and he spoke at the library company's uh, Juneteenth uh, event. And he said, and I think he's right, that the 14th Amendment often gets skipped because people talk about how the 13th Amendment gets passed in 1865 and then the 15th Amendment and then they treat the 14th Amendment as it was imp as if it were imperfect and had to be fixed by the 15th Amendment. But in point of fact, the 14th Amendment kind of kept the issues of what was involved in, stuff in, in citizenship very wide. And the 15th Amendment narrowed the focus specifically the suffrage. And I'm not a legal historian, but I have a couple of things on the annotated bibliography that's linked to the introduction by two different authors that I think are really fascinating because they go through all the legal cases. And that's death in terms of a public exhibition, but it's fascinating stuff. Uh, uh, this woman, Carrie Burnham here in uh, Philadelphia, was very interested in uh, voting. That was, again, what she considered the wedge issue after 1870. And she made, filed a case that she should be able to vote because the 14th and 15th Amendment provided enough uh, uh, basis for her being eligible to vote. And it went all the way to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and she lost at that mm -hmm. stage. She lost because, and the judge, Judge Sharswood specifically said, because she was not a free man, because he looked very specifically at the wording of the amendment and uh, basically tossed it out. And she went on and she became the first uh, female graduate of Penn's Law School in the 1880s. Um, so I'm a huge fan of Carrie Burnham, but the type that her speeches were printed in is incredibly small. And frankly, the University of Pennsylvania has good material and it's not at the library company, including a mm. lovely photo of her. Um, because she's one of, you know, the people they're very proud of, <laughs> you know. Right. But there are bunches of people. We know Susan B. Anthony was arrested in Rochester in 1872 when she tried to vote in the presidential election. Yep. Um, presumably, she had a choice between Grant and Woodhull. <laughs> Grant, by the way, had seemed to back suffrage for women and then did an about face after he was elected. Um, but Susan B. Anthony was arrested and fined. Yes. Uh, but a lot of women didn't go and get arrested. They filed cases. There was Virginia Minor. Oh gosh, where was she? I always forget where, which state Virginia Minor was, but go to the annotated bibliography link to the introduction if you're interested in some of these court cases that, again, get into the weeds, but really interesting weeds, but weeds that you can't show in a public gallery where you really have like a few seconds to get people's attention and draw them in and solid text just is a hard sell. Right, right. Well, and I remember going back and forth a bit too, even about descriptions um, beside these items, you know, how much time uh, can you occupy someone um, in, in a gallery? I think it's a little different. I think most of the text that's up on the website, right, is the, the same material that would be up next to it if you're standing in the gallery in and of itself. Um, but there's lots of decisions that, that have to be made about kind of what story is being told how much detail is there and how to maintain someone's um, attention as you're, you're kind of moving through this material, um, which I just think I, as someone who constantly has to make decisions too in writing um, and doing research, I think these are interesting um, uh, pieces to kind of peel back 
um, the cover a little bit to be able to see what was going on uh, behind putting this together. So I think that this has brought together, I mean, a number of, of themes that we're still seeing um, important as important pieces of debates today and that, that the pandemic, I think, is, is only making actually more stark and more important. Um, you're talking about, uh, Connie talked a bit about this kind of lack of a unity of purpose um, among women during this time. And I think we can see this as a, a kind of long-standing theme across uh, from the kind of antebellum period, um, talking about both that development of, of different gender ideals and yet their, uh, the unequal ability of women to be able to achieve some of those kinds of things. Um, coalescing in some of these movements um, that are, as I alluded to kind of at the beginning, women wanting to be able to improve the world around them, improve their lives, improve the lives of other women and other men, and yet not being able to agree on how exactly to get there. And I think that's a, a, a big part of this story. Did when you, as you were putting this together, um, did you foresee that that would be so much a part of the story of women getting things done, do you think? Well, I think, it, I mean, I don't know if I, this is the right answer, but <laughs> when I look at philanthropy, you know, all the whole picture of philanthropy, I see a lot of people, and I alluded to this in the beginning, telling other people what they should do you know, how they can fix their lives. So it's help, but it's mm. help that has a lot of um, assumptions that the, the, the people who have privilege can say what people who have less privilege and significantly less privilege should do and what will serve them and you don't have a lot of self-determination of being encouraged. You don't have a lot. You have a lot of people doing good, but you don't necessarily have a lot of people saying, well, I should give up some of my pri privilege so that others can have equality. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the, uh, Achilles heel of activism sometimes, I think, that people are blind to their own privileged status. Um, I'm not sure that's where I <laughs> should have gone. <laughs> it's a little too soapboxy, perhaps, but I think it, it's the kind of thing that I really think women's history has to grapple with over and over again in collections like ours, which is print-based, which automatically factors out people who aren't literate and automatically factors out people who can't afford certain privileges like uh, right. owner, book ownership or library membership or the privilege of having the time to go to the library if money isn't involved. Uh, I, it's, 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 it's a factor of being at the library company that we have to deal with, that there's a sort of a um, de facto elitism to being what right. we are. Right. It assumes a lot on the, on the part of the user, I suppose, and, and um, I think it's important as you're saying, to kind of remember that, especially with things that are so text-based, um, it's, it's a little bit different as you get into kind of visual pieces that can kind of reach across lines of literacy, um, but text-based materials um, uh, indicate particular things, I guess, about, about their users and producers. So I want to just remind everyone, and I, I know that you can put um, questions into q and A. I I don't think I see any raised hands, but I do want to make sure this time that we have time to hear from um, the
the the audience if you have questions or um, comments that you'd like to contribute to the discussion. I want to make sure that we can recognize those today. So please feel free to raise hands or uh, if you'd like to come on mic um, or submit questions to the Q&A as well. I wonder if I could try um, uh, something different for us, which would be just to allow everyone to talk because we're a pretty small group right now. And uh, so I'm just asking us all to exercise some degree of, uh, you know, basic, you know, etiquette, which is more difficult on Zoom. Um, <laughs> so you're all going to have an opportunity to unmute yourself if, um, if uh, you wish to join. Are we going live? Yes. Yes, we are. Okay. My name is Carrie Bryan. And thanks to Connie, when I was, dis I was discovering history as if it didn't exist, um, did a lot of research in the, the library company looking into the great sanitary fair and the women involved. I particularly did a, a lot of work about some of the women involved, read more, a whole bunch of, uh, at any rate, What's been frustrating for me tonight is like, I've had so much, I, I want to talk to you. And, <laughs> and, and I'm watching you on a screen and it's like, yeah, and then there's this and that, whatever. So I really miss live seminars. Um, I don't have really questions per se, it's, but it's what I'm so aware of, of how I'm so glad I was born a hundred years later because <laughs> these women were so constricted but they were corseted metaphorically and physically at that time. They couldn't breathe because of what was expected of them. And you get a few, you get, uh, Amelia Bloomer is, is amazing. I'd love to meet her. Mm. But you have others, you know, who, who the, a woman I've researched deeply is a woman named Elizabeth Hutter. And she's from kind of Pennsylvania Dutch, and it's a long story, but she was very active during the Civil War. She, and before that, she founded the Northern Home for Friendless Children in 1853, which actually still exists. It's morphed, but it's actually still the, the Northern Home for uh, Northern Children's Services. But she was actually at Gettysburg with her nurse's kit. She was the head of the... Uh, the, it's a complicated name, what is it? the revenue, the, uh, the revenue income da, 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 committee for the Great Central Fair that raised almost a quarter million dollars. So I'm, where am I going with this? Just that I'm so excited that other people are interested in these women, excited by their lives. And I just wish that there was a, a forum where we could talk, not virtually, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you for those comments, Carrie. I think there is, while it's super convenient, I was just saying to Will and Connie when we started, it's the webinar um, software is really nice and clean in terms of making this um, nice and easy for people to be able to tune in at home, which is great. And as someone who doesn't live in Philadelphia, I, I appreciate this too. But you're right, it does, um, it in, introduces an impersonal aspect that normally doesn't exist in these public programs or seminars or things like that. And so while we're gaining so much um, by able to be, by being able to come together digitally or remotely, I guess I should say, um, we are also losing a little bit in terms of this. But I, like you, I love hearing about other people who are as um, interested and excited by these women too, um, because they they lived to me in a fascinating period to try to navigate um, what they wanted to do, their personal desires, and and how to contribute in their world. And I just find that endlessly fascinating. You can't see me, but I'm nodding my head. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's, that's the part that we, we right. kind of lose there, but. <laughs> right. And I'm like, two thumbs up, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Would anyone else like to I contribute? I see a couple of hands up. 
I, yeah, Jean Wolf. Um, oh, hi, Jean. <laughs> hi. Um, I have a question for Connie about the um, slave of the rolling pin because I don't think that's uh, an anachronistic title because there are lots of women, I think, from my generation I know who were slaves of the rolling pin <laughs> based on where their husbands came from and what they like to eat. So can you tell us the author and um, when this was written? Yes, um, that was um, Abby Morton Diaz and I no, it's from the 1870s because... Uh, okay, well, I, I won't hold you to, you know, find I will details send of the it to you. <laughs> but it, it would be fun to take a look at at some point because from grandparents to mother to daughter and now, and now my, my own daughter, um, rolling pins have been a very important portion of our kitchen life. And they serve for lots of good uses too, from Play-Doh to, to <laughs> other things. So, the story's um, wonderful. Um, but, but, in, in mean, many, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I can see your concern about the, the concept of being a slave to a kitchen item. But in truth, I think women, that has always been the role of women and you can't get away from that. Well, yes, but I want to give you, I want to be a spoiler for the, sh for the story. Okay. Uh, the author says we've got to band together as women and tell the men that they shouldn't demand pies all the time. Uh, and that's the end. Uh, <laughs> they're going to, the radical step they need to take is make an appeal to the men because they, throughout the story, they're telling each other they shouldn't do it. And then the final punchline is, tell the men we can't do it. It's a lovely story. I'll send it to you. Or I'll, that, would be, I'll, that would be fun. <laughs> let me see if, in fact, I think I, I I'll, let me, let me move, mute myself and see if I can get something into the chat. Thank you. Jean, you make such an interesting point about the two points actually about the rolling pin and how it is linked to particular kinds of food, right? In particular, I I, I think about this only because I, I own a rolling pin, but I try to actively kind of avoid situations <laughs> where I need to use it. <laughs> and not that I don't eat those foods, but I will simply purchase them. Um, because someone else will have used that rolling pin. But so first it was making me think a bit about, you know, what kinds of food items that this is indicating that you're using. But also I love your kind of illusion that this is a, a useful tool in multiple ways. Um, and so it makes me want to, I, I don't think I'm in the position to write this, but it makes me want to read a, a longer history, not just of kitchen utensils, but of something like that, that is so, um, uh, specifically kind of gendered and connected to particular kinds of cuisine, particular kinds of food uh, that people would be, be interested in. So thank you for that. I was writing down a couple of little notes just thinking about that too. Okay. <laughs> so I know we had another hand up. I think um, Christy potentially wanted to participate as well. well I, I'd like to um, interject that I have my this is a side, but this is an aside. Um, I have my grandmother's wedding present, which is a hand-blown glass rolling pin in my kitchen. Uh -huh. Fill it full of ice cubes so that it wouldn't stick to the to the glass. And she made many pies, um, and so have I, but not with that rolling pin. Um, <laughs> but I, um, I'm. Uh, um, just want to say that I'm a member of the Women's Club of Concord, New Hampshire. Um, we started in 1893, so it's a little bit later than um, the uh, era that, that the seminars have been uh, covering. Um, however, our mission was really similar, and I suspect that the early history um, has to have been similar to what you were saying. Um, I wish I had been more aware of women's clubs when my late mother-in-law was alive, because she was a more than 50-year member. 
And the kinds of contributions that they made to the Concord community are just amazing. We have scrapbooks that go back, you know, decades and decades. Um, and the kinds of things that were uh, cut out of the newspapers and put in these scrapbooks and then given to the president of the uh, um, accomplishments that they had during their tenure. Uh, it, it really is fun to read them. And I really, um, I, I have enjoyed this series so much. And it has given me the impetus to, to collect, I, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do the oral histories because I'm about to be really old, but, um, I, you know, I miss, I'm, I'm missing the oral histories of those that came before me, but mm -hmm. at least getting us to write things down and not have everything digital, because who knows what the uh, media will be a hundred years from now. I think about that pretty consistently too, about, you know, it's great to have things that are digital, but will there be machines that can access those things? Exactly. In 50 years or a hundred years. Um, as someone who spent 15 years living in New England as well, I uh, am a former member of the Hebron Connecticut Women's Club. I was very young when I was, well, or younger uh, than I was, than I am now when I was part of it. Um, and I wish I had known at the time that there was a whole like you, that there was a much longer history of these women's clubs um, because it did, it fundraised and helped out with kind of various family and, and kind of school oriented uh, projects within the community. But I wish I would have kind of had a better sense of, of what that longer trajectory was when I was there, but it, it just didn't line up for me in terms of that. Um, but right. And Connie did um, refer to the novel, The Woman's Club, which I did yep. read a number of years ago, um, but it's not going to make me go back and read it again. <laughs> but I think <laughs> what you're saying about, like, you know, preserving the, those materials, um, especially as, mm -hmm. as potentially these younger, younger generations either um, adopt this kind of later, maybe, I don't know, I don't know where women's clubs will end up going, how popular they'll continue and end up, to end up being, but if they have all of this material um, documenting their experiences, that's such a, it's a dissertation in the making down the road, I think, for someone, so. Um, just as an aside, the um, Women's Club of Concord was given the Chamberlain House by Nellie Chamberlain, who died in the Spanish influenza in 1919. She died in 1918. We, we, we got the high Victorian home in um, 1919. Um, Excellent. And so it's, a, it's a, a real gem and beloved house for us. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for participating throughout these. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And, and it's nice to hear from you. Uh, this, this evening. And, and thank you to Connie for for posting the publication. It's I pulled it up, so it's in the chat box. <laughs> Everybody can yeah. find it. Yes, please. Uh, it's it is a treat to read. Um, so please do uh, go to the link <laughs> so that you can keep that um, and extend extend your learning, I guess, from this right. um, conversation too. Other other comments, other uh, contributions anyone would like to make? It's Carrie Bryan again, just to say that uh, I did a course at Penn a couple of years ago about food and culture, and I delved deeply into Philadelphia cookbooks, women's cookbooks, a, a particular women's cookbooks of the 19th century, and that is Oh, and a, at a time when women did not have other ways to express themselves, it is, it is a glorious way to understand how those women were living. You get down to the nitty gritty of what they use, the material culture, and how they saw their roles. It's just fast. It was a fascinating mm -hmm. project. So just there's 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 world there's so many worlds of to discover and study out there. Just saying. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's something actually Connie and I had talked a bit about in terms of kind of opportunities and um, uh, openings that still exist um, in this um, subject. I mean, I, I hope we're not, I don't think we're giving you the, the impression that this is everything has been done, everything has ex been explored and written about. 
Um, I mean, I think that's one of the really amazing parts about getting to do work at library company is every time I'm there, I get to see something different, um, often kind of unexpected. And there's so much material um, that still could use treatment um, by people who are willing to kind of go back and do the reading um, and do some assessment of this, this time period. And I think this year it's been great because 1920 has been getting a lot of attention, but there's still so much, particularly in this period, and this was why I was so excited to work with Connie on this exhibit, um, thinking about these intersections of the, the debates of, of, of reconstruction, the debates about um, how to change the constitution um, intersecting with these ideas about kind of women in public and private. I think there's a lot of space there um, to continue to talk about that and, and um, uh, go not just into what Stanton and Anthony were doing, who are of course really, really important. And as Connie said, we're, we didn't try to ignore them totally, but we wanted to tell a different kind of story um, through these materials. But there's, there's still much to be said, I think. And I, uh, I think that women who are living now um, actually are particularly sensitive to some of the debates that are, that are showing up in this material. So we're, we're advocating that there's far more uh, to do, far more places to explore related to this. Okay. Any other commentary, questions? Just thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for being part of this. Thank you for, yeah. for attending. And before you go, you should listen. I know Will wants to say a couple of things because Library Company never stops producing uh, events. And so even though this event will uh, be over, uh, the show will go on in other ways. Thank you. Um, and just a very brief note here. Uh, we have a very busy week coming up um, and that continues with Connie, who is generously going to host our next fireside chat with Megan Springate on uh, queer women and the fight for suffrage. So very much in keeping with the subject matter today. So seven o'clock tomorrow, if you're not fed up with Zoom, you're not fed up with the rest of us, please come. Uh, next Tuesday, our curator of uh, printed books, Rachel D'Agostino, is going to be leading our very first online collection review. That'll be an afternoon program. And then next Wednesday, we continue our journey on online seminars or this grand experiment <laughs> into online seminars. And believe me, I can commiserate in terms of wishing that we could be doing these in the reading room. But in the meantime, we're going to keep learning one way or another. And uh, Dr. Janie Calvert is going to lead a seminar on John Dickinson and the making of the U.S. Constitution. And she's a very special guest, which we probably couldn't get if we were doing it in person. Uh, Liz... Liz uh, Kovar is going to join us. She is uh, responsible for the Benjamin Franklin podcast. So we're delighted to have her as a special guest. So at least we can do a little bit more collaboration while we're using these online platforms. But um, before we go, I'd like to invite all of you to unmute yourselves and to join me in thanking Amy Sobchak Joseph and Connie King for being stupendous seminar leaders. Let's give them a round of applause. Bravo. You know, applaud for Connie. <laughs> <laughs> and to all. And to Will. <laughs> and to Will. And, and to Will, who's, who is stuck through all of these as well. This so is, thank, thanks this, so much. Yeah. So um, I'll be following up with a recording of this and a survey. I encourage all of you to take an, uh, you know, it'll take you one minute to respond to the survey. And then in the meantime, look ahead to all the events we have coming up. I really do hope you can continue to participate with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good night, everyone. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.